What is the relationship between international economics and politics? What are the political consequences of international economic events? Who benefits and who loses from global economic cooperation? How does national politics shape the international economy? What is the link between trade, jobs, and wages? Why are some countries rich and others poor? The field of International Political Economy, IPE, encompasses all of these questions. Quite simply, it is the study of how political and economic forces relate to one another in the international system. Here are some examples, hypothetical and real, of how the international political economy works in everyday life. The newly elected president of the United States announces 25% tariffs on a list of Chinese products as a response to years of unfair trade practices of China. A U.S. sneaker company, known for its supporting campaign, strongly opposes the tariffs because its production process relies on shoe components from China. The company representative submits a letter to the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative and argues that the tariffs will significantly increase the price of a sneaker for U.S. customers create less demand for sneakers, and eventually lead to layoffs and even factory closures in the United States. Meanwhile, the Boot and Shoe Workers Union is organizing a rally in front of the White House to protest the new trade policy. The 27 countries of the European Union issued new environmental regulations to address climate change. Companies and industries that wish to sell to the European market face a dilemma. They must either comply by changing their whole production process or lose access to millions of customers. The change in production process, however, has the potential to disturb their supply chain, increase the chain, increase their production costs, and eventually drive up the prices. A builder in Germany hires a Nigerian website design team to maintain the web page of his construction company. He is happy to get the same service at a fraction of the cost since local website design companies charge on average triple the Nigerian price. A Filipino immigrant sends a large portion of her paycheck back home using an online money transfer service. The whole process takes only a couple of minutes. She is working as a house helper in one of the Persian Gulf countries and has not seen her children for the past two years. However, she is happy to know that her mom, who is taking care of the kids while she is gone, will be able to pay off some of her debt to a local grocery store and even spare a few extra dollars to buy school supplies for the kids. Grocery store and even spare a few extra dollars to buy school supplies for the kids. All of these examples highlight the most important characteristic of the contemporary international political economy. Globalization. In simple terms, globalization can be defined as the free flow of ideas, people, goods, services, and capital across borders. It is the integration of economies and societies into a global world market. No national state has the resources to produce all of the complex products that its people want to consume. Rapid capital flows have the capacity to make or break a national economy, and regular and irregular migration continuously tests the boundaries of state control over national borders. Although it has reached unprecedented levels within the past few decades, globalization is not a new phenomenon. When we focus phenomenon, when we focus on international trade as a driving force behind global economic integration, as many economists do, we see that the world economy has gone through at least two cycles of globalization and deglobalization since the 16th century. Past periods of globalization, such as the one that occurred immediately before World War I, were centered on trade. Today, by contrast, global flows of money have reached truly astronomical, some would say alarming, levels. There are three underlining factors that explain the current levels of global integration. First, advances in transportation and communication technologies have significantly reduced shipping time and cost. Information technology allows instant communication between various parts of a production chain, no matter where they are located, 
and the logistics of big retail stores in the United States are filled with items from Vietnam, Bangladesh, and China. Second, the steady increase in gross domestic product, GDP, per capita, and living standards in many parts of the world has led to a bigger middle class with a higher demand for basic consumer goods that cannot be efficiently produced in any single country. Moreover, an increasing number of people have gained access to these basic consumer goods, such as flat-screen televisions, refrigerators, and cars. The rich have started relying more on imported luxury brands to differentiate themselves from the middle class and signal their wealth. This higher demand for international brands has also increased the demand for open borders. The third aspect of globalization is its dependence on the political decisions of national governments. Scholars' national brands has also increased the demand for open borders. The third aspect of globalization is its dependence on the political decisions of national governments. Scholars of economics and international relations sometimes argue that globalization has hindered state sovereignty, the ability of countries to make decisions for themselves. It is certainly true that the policies and preferences of individual governments, especially those that are economic powerhouses, have a substantial impact on the character of global economic integration. In addition, cooperation among countries conducted through international institutions such as the World Trade Organization, WTO, deepened the global integration by reducing uncertainty and building trust. From an economic perspective, globalization has two major components. It also comprises issues around immigration, a topic covered in Chapter 12. In this chapter, we begin with a history of how the world's political economy has evolved since World War II. It is an extraordinary story of change, adaptation, innovation, and yes, exploitation. Changes in the structure of trade and capital flows make up an important part of this story. But where do politics come in? The answer is everywhere. Both international trade and international capital flows are regulated heavily by governments. These governments, in turn, must respond to their citizens in ways that depend on a variety of complex factors, whether they are democracies or autocracies, whether the ruling power is right or left-wing, how organized domestic labor and business interests are, and so on. Add into the mix the central role of internet and business interests are, and so on. Add into the mix the central role of international organizations, such as the World Trade Organization, and the International Monetary Fund, IMF, which are for their part responsible to member governments, and you have quite a complex political environment. Finally, we discuss some of the controversies and debates surrounding globalization today. Is it the greatest driver of wealth that the world has ever seen? Or is it an engine exploiting the poor and destroying local systems of production? Is the growing global populism an inevitable consequence of globalization? Or is the globalization of societies and economies the only restraint on rising xenophobia and oppression? Will the populist leaders in the United States and elsewhere threaten the interconnectedness of the world? Or is the system too robust to collapse? And who benefits and loses from too robust to collapse? And who benefits and loses from our deeply integrated world? Understanding how we got to where we are is critical in thinking about what comes next. That is why we begin our exploration of the international political economy with an overview of its history, specifically since World War II. This is a brief historical summary. For more detail, see Chapter 9. The first three decades after World War II, which began with the defeat of Germany and Japan in 1945, were characterized by the Cold War between two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, and between two economic systems, capitalism and communism. They are also marked by the creation of dozens of new states, most of them poor and often politically unstable. 
all seeking to develop as rapid and mass violence before finally finding the path of rapid growth and greater stability. The post-war years also saw a period of rapid reconstruction and growth in Western Europe, and under U.S. protection, and a concomitant stagnation in most of the Soviet bloc. An important part of Western Europe's economic and political success was the creation of the European Economic Community in 1958, later to become the European Union, or EU. The EU today has 27 country members that allow the free movement of goods, services, capital, and people across borders that coordinate their policies and, in some cases, share a common currency and that negotiate as a single unit in international economic forums. Indeed, while the EU cannot be considered a nation-state, it is the most deeply integrated international organization in the world and was before the organization in the world and was before the departure of the United Kingdom in 2020, the world's largest economic entity. The oil shocks of the 1970s created another turning point in the world economy. Oil producers in the Middle East, led by Saudi Arabia, cut production to drive up the price of oil largely as a punishment for the West's support of Israel. This triggered recession and inflation in the United States and many other countries and ultimately contributed to a terrible debt crisis in the non-oil producing developing world, one that slowed and even reversed development gains of the previous decades. The 1980s brought with them a swing to neoliberal economic policies in many countries, led by the ascendancy of Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom and Ronald Reagan in the United States. These policies rejected the idea of encouraging economic progress and in redistributing wealth ideas that were ubiquitous in the post-war period, even in the capitalist West. Instead, neoliberal thinkers saw government as the problem, arguing that private businesses should be freed as much as possible from regulation, that taxes should be lowered, and that welfare policies like unemployment insurance should be reduced. On a global level, these ideas were expanded to the developing world through the so-called Washington Consensus, a series of pro-market policies and principles encouraged by the conditions on World Bank and IMF loans. In the meantime, the global economy was being transformed by the information revolution, something that many commentators see as the most significant economic development since the Industrial Revolution. Economic development since the Industrial Revolution. The information revolution began largely in the United States with the development of more sophisticated and smaller computers, and ultimately with the internet. An increasing number of jobs now involved collecting, manipulating, and using information to the point where the world's richest countries have deindustrialized to focus instead on a knowledge-based economy. Most industrial production is now done in the middle-income countries where labor is less expensive. Nothing could prepare the world for the stunning events of 1989 through 1991, which saw the fall of the Berlin Wall, the transitions of most of communist Eastern Europe to more democratic and market-based institutions, and ultimately the collapse and fragmentation of the Soviet Union itself. This fundamental transition of the international order undermined communism as a response to the collapse of the Eastern Bloc. The United States was able to lead the world in the deepening of the international trading system. The world was stunned again on September 11, 2001, when Al-Qaeda launched its attacks on New York and Washington, D.C. The United States entered armed conflicts in Afghanistan and later Iraq as it turned its resources to confront a new threat, global terrorism. These conflicts destabilized the Middle East and snapped the resources and diplomatic leverage of the United States. And all of this was at a time when China, having turned toward more market-oriented development in the late 1970s, was beginning to challenge the United States for global economic preeminence. Indeed, China's rapid growth, which has generally exceeded 8% per year 
over the past three decades has put it generally exceeded 8% per year over the past three decades has put it within striking distance of eclipsing the United States as the world's largest economy, though, of course, it remains a much poorer country per person. Other countries, notably Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa, often termed with China the BRICS, combined rapid growth with large populations to cement their status in the world economic system alongside the United States, the European Union, and Japan. The rise of China and other emerging economies has meant that the brief period of dominance that the United States enjoyed after the collapse of the Soviet Union is now over. While the United States remains the most important economy in the world, China and, when acting together, the EU can nearly match its weight. And China may nearly match its weight. And China may pass the United States as the world's largest economy in the next several years. At the end of the chapter, we explore the potential implications of these changes for the future. Here we take a closer look at one of the most important elements of the international political economy, global trade. We begin with a look at the basic economies necessary to understand how trade works. We then move to a discussion of the international structures that regulate trade policy and conclude with an examination of the domestic politics of trade. International trade is the movement of goods such as wheat, steel, and iPhones, and services such as legal representation, business consulting, and call center advice across borders. These, for example, crude oil, such products a car, capital goods such as machines used to make other products, or intermediate goods, for example brake pads that will be added to a motorcycle in a factory. Indeed, an important characteristic of modern trade is that it is increasingly conducted within firms. Intra-firm trade occurs when large companies that do business across borders, known as multinational corporations, produce different components of the same product in different countries, assemble the product in yet another country, and sell it in yet another. So the products crisscrossing borders are not just consumer products, say televisions, made in one country being sold in another, but are pieces of products, say electronic components, that companies move internally from one place to another. This is called a global supply chain. This is called a global supply chain. Global production is now so truly integrated that it is often hard to tell a quote-unquote Chinese product from an quote-unquote American one. The Economics of Trade The theory of comparative advantage developed by British economist David Ricardo in 1817 still forms the foundation of our understanding of the economics of trade. Ricardo rejected the mercantilist assertion that there is limited wealth in the world and that this wealth could only be acquired at the expense of other states. Instead, he contended that states could get bigger shares from a growing economic pie if they allocated their resources, land, labor, and capital, efficiently. This should be done through the market mechanism as had been mapped out several decades earlier by Adam Smith realize in industries or products that were better at producing and trade with other countries for things that those countries produced more efficiently. In this way, everyone could benefit. It is important to emphasize that Ricardo's theory was about comparative rather than absolute advantage. The idea of absolute advantage makes a less controversial claim. When two states are better at producing different things, they should focus on what they do best and trade with each other. For example, if state A produces smartphones more efficiently than state B, and state B produces shoes more efficiently than state A, it means that state A has an absolute advantage in making smartphones, and state B has an absolute advantage in, making, in manufacturing shoes. Therefore, state A 
should use its land, labor, and capital to produce smartphones. Therefore, state A should use its land, labor, and capital to produce smartphones. And state B should use its land, labor, and capital to produce shoes. And then they should trade with each other by specializing in their absolute advantages in trading with each other, both state A and state B would be better off. However, Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage satisfied a more pressing and less obvious question. Why would we trade if it were better at producing everything? In other words, why would a state that has an absolute advantage in many industries still specialize in one and trade with others? According to the theory of comparative advantage, the theory is simple. States should focus on things they produce more efficiently, not necessarily in comparison to other countries, but rather relative to everything else they do. Let's use a hypothesis to other countries, but rather relative to everything else they do. Let's use a hypothetical example to illustrate the reasoning. BTS is a South Korean pop band. All seven members of the group are amazing singers, songwriters, and producers, and of course, phenomenal dancers. They have high stamina to keep up with their intense performances, which means they can run, dance, and work more quickly than most people. For this reason, BTS members can most likely clean their studio faster than anyone else. But should they use their time in this way? Let's apply the concepts of opportunity cost and comparative advantage Imagine that BTS can clean their entire studio in two hours. In the same two hours, BTS can perform at a stadium concert and earn about $5 million. By contrast, clean BTS's studio in four hours. In the same four hours, he can perform with his local band downtown and earn $100. BTS's opportunity cost the cost the group is incurring for cleaning the studio instead of performing at the concert is $5 million, while Justin's opportunity cost for cleaning BTS's studio instead of busking on the street is just $100. BTS has an absolute advantage in cleaning their studio since they do it more quickly, but Justin has a comparative advantage but he has a, because he has a lower opportunity cost. Therefore, rather than cleaning their studio, BTS should perform at the stadium concert and hire Justin for cleaning. As long as the group pays Justin more than $100 and less than, fi- less than $5 million for the job, both are better off specializing in their own jobs and trading their services. It is the same way for countries. To simplify international economics, let's assume that the world has only two countries, state A and state B, and let's assume they can produce only two goods, smartphones and shoes. In this scenario, state A can produce 10 smartphones or 30 pairs of shoes. However, state B can produce four smartphones or 20 pairs of shoes. Note that state A has an absolute advantage in both smartphones, and shoes, since it can produce both products more efficiently than state B. However, this does not mean that state A should produce both products. Instead, both state A and state B should specialize in one good and trade with costs. Table 10.1. We know that state A gives up three pairs of shoes when it allocates all its resources to producing one smartphone. On the flip side, when it allocates all its resources to producing a pair of shoes, it gives up one third of a smartphone. That is to say, the opportunity cost for state A of producing one smartphone is is three pairs of shoes, and opportunity cost of producing a pair of shoes is one third of a smartphone. In comparison, state B gives up five pairs of shoes to produce one smartphone and one-fifth of a smartphone to produce a pair of shoes. This means that the opportunity cost for state B of producing one smartphone 
is five pairs of shoes, and the opportunity cost of producing one pair of shoes is one fifth of a smartphone. Of a smartphone. Which country should produce smartphones and which should produce shoes? The answer depends on which country has the lower opportunity cost. State A has a comparative advantage in producing smartphones. Its opportunity cost is three pairs of shoes instead of five. By contrast, State B has an opportunity cost for producing shoes with one-fifth instead of one-third of a smartphone for each pair. Therefore, it should specialize in footwear. Here's the key point. Although State A has an absolute advantage in producing shoes, State B has a comparative advantage due to its lower opportunity cost. If these two countries specialize in their comparative advantage and trade with each other, they will be significantly better off than if they tried to produce both products domestically. This then is the fundamental try to produce both products domestically. This then is the fundamental economic defense of free trade. If free trade is so good, why is it controversial? Why do governments engage in protectionism, policy interventions to limit trade? Before trying to answer the latter question, it is important to begin with a discussion of the trade policy tools at a government's disposal. A tariff is a tax on imports. Tariffs increase the price of an imported good or service, making it less competitive overall than a domestically produced good or service. The goal is to support the local industry by discouraging consumers from buying imported goods. Historically, governments have used tariffs to protect infant industries and to develop new comparative advantages. All major developed industries tariffs to support burgeoning domestic industries in the hopes that they will reach the efficiency level necessary to compete in the international economy. While the benefits of this protective policy are concentrated on the local industry protected from foreign competition, the costs are diffuse and usually borne by consumers and foreign producers of the protected good or service. One of the immediate effects of a tariff is to increase the price of consumer goods produced by the protected industry. Domestic producers reliant on cheap products imported from other countries for their operation may also pass for cost increases into consumers through higher prices. Finally, protective tariffs may disincentivize innovation and improvements of goods and services in the protected industry and lead to... Tariffs are not the only protectionist tool in the government's toolbox. A quota is a restriction imposed on the number of goods that can be imported from other countries. Like tariffs, quotas are designed to support a specific domestic industry or interest group at the expense of foreign producers and domestic consumers. Subsidies, for their part, are direct government payments to domestic producers, often to increase their competitiveness in the global market. In the case of subsidies, the government does not tax or limit imports from other countries, but rather provides financial support to an industry or a business so that it can compete with international counterparts. Subsidies can be in the form of direct cash payments, tax breaks, inexpensive loans, or something else in domestic industries or businesses. The cost of the adjustment, in this case, is incurred by taxpayers. Finally, government regulations may also work as barriers to trade. Environmental regulations, health rules, or worker standards can create non-physical barriers to trade since international producers will lose access to national markets unless they adhere. Of course, the use of regulations may be justified by genuine and legitimate concerns, but their trade effects are undeniable. Comparative advantage shows that trade maximizes the income of participating states, at least in the short run. But there are still reasons that many citizens and political actors 
are trade skeptics. The first is that trade, at least according to many scholars, may lock a country into producing products at the lower end of the value chain. T-shirts, for example, instead of airplanes. If we go back to our example, Justin might end up cleaning studios for the rest of his life if he focuses on his current comparative advantage every time he needs to make an employment choice. He might decide, instead, to forego his cleaning income temporarily so he can study singing and become a world-renowned artist earning millions of dollars per concert. In a similar sense, trade protection can be justified as a temporary measure to support the growth of new domestic industries, though in practice, such strategies often come with high costs. The idea is that protectionism, as an economic policy, aids new domestic industries that are trying to increase their competitiveness. Tariff protection might help the infant industries grow and become competitive in the world market without being strangled and increase their competitiveness. Tariff protection might help the infant industries grow and become competitive in the world market without being strangled immediately by more advanced foreign producers. Ideally, when the industry takes off, it'll no longer need the protection of trade barriers. It can then compete in the world market, adding to the comparative advantages of the national economy. However, the cost of these protectionist policies is usually shifted to the consumers who end up losing access to a variety of products or having to pay more for a lower quality domestic counterpart of an imported good or service. The second motive for protectionism is that free trade, despite its aggregate benefits, hurts specific, clearly defined groups. Most notably, among these are workers and business owners in the industries that compete with trees that compete with importers and would not be successful in the international market, as well as in rich countries like the United States less skilled workers in general. With this in mind, how can we predict the trade policies that governments will adopt? Because various groups are directly affected by protectionist or liberal trade policies, they try to influence government decision-making. But why would governments adopt a trade policy that would protect a narrow interest group while hurting the public? Scholars argue that the more concentrated the cost or benefit of a trade policy is, the more organized an interest group will be. The more organized an interest group is, the more substantial its influence on government policy. Since the benefits of protectionist policies are concentrated in a few domestic industries, while as a result will have more say in government's trade policy. Particular political and social institutions also help determine whether protectionist or free trading forces hold more political power. There is evidence that democracies, at least in rich countries, have overall less trade protection, likely because they are more responsible for the average voter who benefits from lower lower prices. Among democracies, those with more centralized institutions that are relatively resistant to lobbying, will be more likely to support free trade. And in richer countries where owners of capital tend to benefit more from free trade than worker right-wing governments tend to support freer trade policies than left-wing governments. In the United States, this support freer trade policies than left-wing governments. In the United States, this helps explain why the Republican Party, pre-Trump, had traditionally supported freer trade than the Democratic Party. Of course, trade policy is not just a domestic phenomenon, but an international one as well. The modern era era of trade began in 1944 with the Bretton Woods Conference, where the Allied powers met under U.S. leadership to decide the economic architecture for the post-World War II world. The representatives at this conference suggested the establishment of an international trade organization that could serve as another pillar of the post-war international economic order. 
although the organization never became functional, the idea of setting up an international organization that could reduce uncertainty, an international organization that could reduce uncertainty and punish non-compliance in international trade took hold. After six months of intense negotiations, 23 countries signed a multilateral agreement called the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, GATT, in 1947. The purpose of GATT was to allow members to enter into reciprocal and mutually advantageous arrangements directed to the substantial reduction of tariffs and other barriers to trade and to the elimination of discriminatory treatment in international commerce. Prior to World War II, trade agreements had been conducted bilaterally using tariffs based on reciprocity. For example, two states would agree to have some the same tariff rate on each other's goods, but would have varying tariff rates for other trade partners. GATT GAT replaced bilateral free trade and non-discrimination. States agreed to lower their ta- tariffs and apply the same tariff rate to all GATT members equally. This is called the most favored nation system, where all members are enlisted to receive best trade policy arrangements offered by any other member. GATT was able to lower average tariffs from 22% to 5% in a span of 47 years, and it helped to create an 8% annual growth in world trade between the 50s and 60s. Yet even after eight rounds, periods of trade negotiations, it failed to expand into more complex trade-related issues such as regulating insurance and banking and protecting intellectual property rights like patents and trademarks. Moreover, the national governments deemed it necessary. They continued to go around GATT around GATT requirements by devising new ways of shielding their economies from international competition. These protections, most non-tariff-based barriers, undermined the effectiveness and credibility of GATT. That is why in 1994, during the final negotiation round of GATT, the Uruguay round, 117 members agreed to create a formal international institution that would overcome some of these challenges. Their decision led to the establishment of the World Trade Organization on January 1, 1995. The new organization's stated goal was to create a level playing field by setting and enforcing international trade rules to ensure trade flows smoothly, predictably, and freely as possible. The WTO incorporated the GATT agreement in full, but added other undertakings setting up a dispute settlement mechanism to resolve trade disagreements among its members. If necessary, independent WTO panels were given the authority to authorize sanctions on countries found to violate international trade law. The existence of a structured and effective dispute settlement process has discouraged countries from independently retaliating against an offending country's illegal trade measures by adopting protectionist policies and hence has served as a hedge against the damaging consequences of trade protectionism. Since its founding, the GATT WTO system has expanded geographically to most of the world. It currently has 164 members, including former and current socialist countries such as Russia and China. The 13 countries that are not members of the WTO represent only countries that are not members of the the WTO represent only 0.05% of total world trade and 0.03% of world GDP and 0.7% of the world's population. Despite this, despite this success, however, all is not well with the international trading order. The rise of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, has forced the traditionally dominant players of in the WTO, the United States, European Union, and Japan, to share power with emerging countries. These countries have often have a different agenda from the traditional powers, favoring, for example, 
weaker protection of intellectual property rights and more restrictions on agricultural subsidies. Moreover, even the Western countries have agricultural subsidies. Moreover, even the Western countries have grown increasingly critical of the WTO system. The WTO dispute settlement system has drawn the ire of critics on the left for its alleged disregard for environmental and worker standards, and on the right for its legal ability to overrule the decisions of sovereign states. This has been especially true since the so-called Battle of Seattle in 1999, when waves of anti-globalization protests erupted against a WTO ministerial conference convened in Seattle, and it has grown stronger with the rise of right-wing populism. As a result, the WTO system is now deadlocked, and the world levels of protectionism have grown in the past few years. More liberalization now takes place at the bilateral or regional level. Thanks to a decades-long effort to reduce order in the world under the leadership of the United States, world trade has become truly a global phenomenon. Multinational corporations, with their global supply chains, have become a critical backbone of the globalized system. As noted earlier, MNCs are businesses that have operations in multiple countries. They build their supply chains to tap into the most qualified or inexpensive labor, most abundant raw materials, or closest access to markets in different parts of the world. Your t-shirt might have been designed in the Netherlands, made from cotton grown in India. It might then have been manufactured in Vietnam and sold in Athens, Georgia. The era of territorial expansion for raw materials or access to markets on the model of the British or Dutch East Indies companies is largely over. Instead, businesses expand economically by investing abroad or subsidiaries to take advantage of different comparative advantages across the world. Their business plan is based on producing the most competitive product in the most efficient way possible while keeping their profit margins high. The annual revenues of companies such as Apple, Microsoft, and Walmart are so huge that they take on whole new dimensions, at times dwarfing the economies of many countries across the globe. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, MNCs account for almost one-third of global production and half of all global exports. They also create jobs and wealth around the world. MNCs generate a quarter of employment and 28% of the world GDP. While it is true that states individually and collectively decide on the rule influence over political decision making, they lobby governments for policies favorable to expanding their business further. Indeed, some political economists contend that MNCs are among the key forces pulling strings in international relations though most believe that states are still the primary actors. Regardless, everyone agrees that a huge percentage of global investment and production is done by the multinational corporations. They play undeniable roles in the development of emerging economies and help lead the world economy in research and innovation. We now turn our attention to the financial side of the IPE coin. The international movement of capital is just as important a phenomenon as trade and just as complex. Capital, of course, is another word for money and what money can buy. Any can buy. In the past, capital largely stayed home, secure in domestic banks and stock markets. Today, by contrast, capital crosses borders at the speed of an electron with approximately 6.1 trillion dollars traded every day. Capital flows can be purely for the purpose of achieving, achieving higher returns on investment, as when Americans move their retirement account income into, say, Indian stocks. This is called Foreign Portfolio Investment, FPI. They can also involve the purchase of productive assets, say a hotel or an oil field in another country. This is undertaken typically by MNCs 
and is called Foreign Direct Investment, FDI. Other notable sources of international capital flows includes foreign aid from richer countries to poor countries, migrant remittances from deficits of international capital flows includes foreign aid from richer countries to poor countries, migrant remittances from destination countries to origin countries, as well as aid from international organizations such as the World Bank. Before the Allied powers came together at Bretton Woods to set up a rules and institutions for the post-war economic system, most countries pegged their currencies to gold. The gold standard meant that a government should have enough gold in the central bank to redeem any amount of paper it printed. When the European governments needed to print more money to rebuild their economies and pay reparations after World War I, however, it became clear that there was not enough gold in central banks to support the increased supply of paper money. The gold standard also exacerbated the effects of the Great Depression by preventing countries from stimulating their econ- depression by preventing countries from stimulating their economies with more money. As a result, President Roosevelt pulled the United States off the gold standard in 1933, and other countries quickly followed. The Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944 formally ended the international gold standard and established a fixed exchange rate system where the dollar was pegged to the price of gold and every other currency was pegged to the value of the dollar. The fixed exchange rate system ensured that governments would not devalue their currencies competitively to make their exports cheaper. Devaluation occurs when governments purposely reduce the worth of each unit of their currency vis-a-vis foreign currencies, usually in order to lower the price of their exports in terms of military conflict. The fixed exchange rate system offset the problem and also eased trade and exchange by ensuring the stable value of international currencies. As the dollar replaced gold in the international economy, the United States solidified its role as the dominant economic power in the system. The Bretton Woods Agreement, combined with the GATT negotiations discussed earlier, helped to lay the foundations for the international economic order characterized by a stable exchange rate system, balanced budgets, and low tariff rates. Its purpose, as stated in the GATT agreement, was to raise standards of living, ensure full employment, secure a steady growth of income and demand for goods, develop the full use of resources of the world, and expand the production and exchange of goods. Although the fixed exchange rate is the gold standard, it also created potential problems. The United States was the only country that had the ability to print dollars. Other countries could not simply print more money when there was an imbalance in their budgets, since this would devalue their currency vis-a-vis the dollar. To solve the problem, Bretton Woods established two international financial institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The IMF was designed as a lender of the last resort and could bail out member countries when needed. The World Bank was initially established to help European countries rebuild after the devastation of World War II. Later, the bank expanded its scope and started providing loans and grants to developing countries for poverty reduction and economic development projects. The Bretton Woods system collapsed in 1971 after the United States started printing dollars beyond its gold reserves to finance the Vietnam War and President Johnson's Great Society social programs. The U.S. dollar was no longer pegged to gold, and other countries abandoned the fixed exchange system rate system. However, the main financial institutions of Bretton Woods survived and even thrived after the collapse. The IMF has become an organization with 189 members. While the global fixed exchange rate system no longer exists, the primary responsibility of the organization remains the same, to regulate the international monetary system and to ensure the stability of national and global economies. The IMF still provides loans to countries with 
balance of payment problems, which occur when these countries are systematically importing more than they are exporting. However, traditionally in the 1980s, the IMF began to attach extensive conditionality rules to it, which are systematically importing more than they are exporting. However, traditionally in the 1980s, the IMF began to attach extensive conditionality rules to its loans, rules that were largely based on the free market Washington consensus and intended to overcome the structural problems that led to the crisis in the first place. These bundles of conditions, known in the past as structural adjustment programs, usually required policy adjustments such as trade liberalization, privatization of state-owned businesses, and budget cuts through tighter fiscal policies. The World Bank focuses its efforts on ending extreme poverty and promoting economic development. Since 1947, the World Bank has used traditional loans, interest-free credits, interest-free credits, and grants to finance over 12,000 development projects in more than 170 countries. The bank also provides advice and assistance to governments and businesses in developing countries. Like the IMF, the World Bank uses conditionality in its loans, often promoting free market reforms. Some critics see this practice as neocolonial, a way of to control developing countries informally rather than by seizing territory. Over the past two decades, however, both institutions have responded to these critics by encouraging greater local participation in the creation and evaluation of the conditions. Now that Bretton Woods' monetary system has collapsed, countries are free to choose whether to fix their currency exchange rates to gold, silver, or a hard currency such as the dollar, or to float their currency by allowing it to be bought and sold freely. Two of these choices have trade-offs and are therefore political. Economically smaller countries, for example, may prefer to fix their exchange rates so that their currency rises and falls with a major currency. Ecuador, for example, does this with the dollar to promote trade and investment. The problem is that such a fixed system means that a country can't adjust the value of its currency to stimulate its economy whenever necessary. For this reason, most countries have chosen to keep their currencies at least partially flexible. As we have already seen, there are several ways in which money can flow into a country. Perhaps most obvious, these flows can take the form of payments for a traded good or service. For example, when people in the United States buy a toy from a Chinese wholesale website, they make a monetary payment to the seller for the website. They make a monetary payment to the seller for their purchase. Similarly, when a German business hires a Nigerian website, design team to create their website, it transfers money to its Nigerian account to pay for the team's services. In this case, money flows in the opposite direction of the imported service. If a country exports more than it imports, the money flowing into the country will be more than the money flowing out of the country. And if a country imports more than it exports, the money leaving the country will be more than the money entering. This represents a significant problem in the balance of payments, particularly for developing countries whose exports often do not finance their imports due to declining terms of trade or the reduced value of what they export compared to what they import. Other from what they export compared to what they import. Other forms of financial flows include foreign direct investment, for foreign portfolio investment, and development assistance. FDI occurs when a company based in one country invests in a productive asset based in another country. FDI can have many advantages for the host economy, especially when the money flows come from richer countries to poorer countries. First, FDI brings competition to the domestic market by increasing labor productivity or creating entirely new industries. 
Increased competition, in turn, improves the quality of products and reduces their cost, which significantly enhances consumer welfare. FDI can also contribute to economic growth in recipient countries by JEC's revenue. Moreover, FDI can help build physical infrastructure and bring in new technologies and upgrade local labor skills through the spillover effect. The workers who get the training and learn new skills from international companies can bring their know-how to other companies operating in the local market when they change jobs. When engaging in FDI, companies often buy physical assets, build infrastructure, train workers, transfer machines, and set up whole operations, which becomes an integral part of their global supply or distribution chains. MNCs make these investments in the first place to have access to foreign markets, get closer to production assets, such as cheaper labor or raw materials that might not be available at home, establish their distribution networks, or circumvent the trade barriers imposed by a specific government. These are, these are long-term commitments. That is why it is almost impossible for MNCs to pull out of an economy overnight. On the contrary, foreign portfolio investments is an investment in another country's financial assets that is usually short-term. This characteristic of FPI makes it a double-edged sword for developing countries. On the one hand, FPI can help in economic development by providing the much-needed urgent capital to bridge budget imbalances or to finance development projects. On the other hand, it can also be speculative and easily leave a country which may have adverse effects on the host country's economy, such as a hidden collapse in the value of its currency. Proponents of free market economics contend that in the development gap. However, the net effects of foreign capital inflows on the host economy are contingent upon many factors. Some critics believe that the harm done by attracting the foreign capital may outweigh any benefits for developing countries. For example, if countries adopt austerity policies by deciding to spend less on pro government programs in response to lender conditions, their economic problems risk translating into political instability, though it may happen even faster without access to foreign capital. Popular economic frustration may also undermine confidence in democratic institutions and give rise to extreme ideologies. The current rise in populist parties across the world may be in part a symptom of increased vulnerability to globalization. Vulnerability to globalization. The positive effects of FDI depend on whether and how much the company transfers technology or invests in upgrading the local labor force's skill set. If the multinational corporation brings its own technical and managerial team, restricting domestic workers to manual or entry-level jobs, skill upgrade, or technology diffusion in the local economy will be minimal. However, MNCs may choose to transfer all of their profits to other countries that have lower taxes to avoid paying taxes in the host country. Ownership of key industries is another sticky issue. When foreign countries own strategic industries, which are industries a state considers to be vital for economic development or safety, this might eventually cause serious national security problems or safety. This might eventually cause serious national security problems for the host country. Another downside of international capital is that its potential to pit recipient countries against each other. For example, a country may try to undercut competition from other countries for limited international credit or investment by lowering its environmental standards, easing regulations on worker safety, offering tax cuts, and the like. Other governments, desperate to attract investments into their country, may respond with similar measures. This competitive deregulation process risk 
risks leading to a race to the bottom, which would bring down tax revenues and beneficial regulations around the world. Indeed, many activists have accused MNCs, including prominent U.S. companies such as Apple, of producing precisely to pay paltry wages while avoiding labor and environmental regulations. A tragic example of this phenomenon is occurred in Dhaka, Bangladesh in 2012, when a sweatshop, a factory with poor working conditions, caught fire, resulting in the death of over 100 workers. While the factory was locally owned, it sourced major companies such as IKEA and Walmart. However, there are there is some debate about how often such a race to the bottom occurs. Given that countries sometimes have more leverage than MNCs in investment decisions, this is especially true when MNCs are locating abroad to make use of comparative advantage held by a country or to produce for its domestic market. Of course, it is undeniable that MNCs from rich countries' wages and to avoid regulations. That said, Research has mostly shown that MNCs offer conditions and salaries superior to those of the average local firm. This cheaper production also means that the income of poor peoples in the developed world can go further at the catch register. All of these issues pose complex moral dilemmas and that activists and scholars will be fighting over for years. Moreover, the sudden removal of FPI can cause severe crises in national economies. Many countries can invest or consume their means thanks to foreign investment or credit. Even the world's biggest economy, the United States, has accumulated a total debt of about $25 trillion. Countries usually try to attract new investments to finance their old debts. Countries usually try to attract new investments to finance their old debts. As long as the investors have confidence in the country's ability to pay its debts, the debt, the credit debt payment cycle continues. However, financial markets run on confidence when the economic indicators of the borrowing country show a sign of weakness, this confidence may be shaken. As a result, investors might ask for higher interest rates to cover the higher risks or stop pouring money into the debtor economy entirely. Such a sudden stoppage of capital may disrupt the ability of the debtor country to meet its debt obligations and lead to a debt crisis. A currency crisis might also result from different capital outflows when foreign investors lose confidence in the host economy and it's in the host economy and leave. When the demand for a local currency decreases, the value of that money also increases. This initial devaluation leads to a more significant wave of speculation about the stability of the local con- currency. Therefore, it can create a self-fulfilling prophecy that leads to a steep decline in the value of the local currency. The decline, in turn, spurs a balance of payments problem due to exchange rate instability, since one unit of the local currency can no longer buy as much as it used to in the global market. We conclude our chapter with a reflection on the promise and risks of globalization. The economic order established after World War II and the unprecedented globalization that has come with helped create unparalleled, both in absolute numbers and in percentage terms, see figure 10.2. On average, a person's income increased from $3,300 in 1950 to $14,574 in 2016. This means an average person today is more than four times richer than an average person in 1950. Globalization has linked countries together in an economic web and provides opportunities where they did not exist before. But we are still have a long way to go. 
When we move from averages and look at how real prosperity is distributed in the world, we end up with a grim picture. Yes, the world economy is growing, but not everyone benefits equally from the growth. See figure 10.3. Although the share of the world population living in poverty has declined, the world economy is growing, but not everyone benefits equally from the growth. See figure 10.3. Although the share of the world population living in poverty has declined, nearly one in every 10 people in the world still lives in extreme poverty, more than 80% of them clustering in a handful of countries. The critics of the liberal free market system argue that the globalization of trade and financial finance creates significant adverse effects for certain groups and countries that there is a clear divide between the global north and south see figure 10.3 these critics contend that although the world has become more prosperous than ever before global inequality has also risen to unparalleled free trade and capital mobility was built on an edifice of U.S. power. If the United States is unable to maintain its superpower status, and if China eclipses its power, then there is every reason to believe that a new international economic order with new forms and values will slowly replace what we have now. Another potentially ominous sign for the current international economic order is the rise in populist politics that we have seen in recent years. Populism is an approach to politics that rests on the rejection of elites and quote-unquote the system, and an emphasis on the role of an individual leader in providing the quote-unquote common people what they need. It can take a left an emphasis on the role of an individual leader in providing the quote-unquote common people what they need. It can take a left-wing form, as in Mexico's Lopez Obrador, and his emphasis on the poor as victims of the system, but more often it has a conservative and nationalist bent. Donald Trump's election in the United States is perhaps the most obvious example of this. Brexit, the departure of the United States, kingdom from the European Union and the populist policies of leaders such as Modi of India, Duterte of Philippines, and Bolsonaro of Brazil are examples of right-wing populism's worldwide appeal. All of this raises the question of whether the United States and other key supporters of the open economy will continue inward toward a greater focus on nationalism. Only time will tell. Discussion questions. One, identify three important questions asked by the field of international political economy. How might each of these relate to your everyday life? Question two, name three historical developments in political economy since World War II and provide one reason that each was important. Question three, trade liberalization, or the idea of open, opening markets and lowering barriers to trade, has been foundational to the liberal economic order that was established after World War II. What do you think are the most important costs and most important benefits to trade liberalization? Why are we seeing a backlash? Question four. Why are we seeing a backlash against free trade? As a we seeing a backlash. Question four. Why are we seeing a backlash against free trade? As illustrated by the rise of economic nationalism in recent years. Who gains and who loses from free trade or protectionism? What are the roles of domestic political institutions and interest groups in setting trade policy? Question five. Is the state still the predominant actor in international political economy? Why or why not? Does this rise of non-state 
actors, especially MNCs, diminish the power of states in the global economy? Question 6. Scholars and policymakers disagree on the consequences of globalization. Some argue that globalization is a positive force that has pulled millions of people out of absolute poverty, improving living standards across the world, and created a sense of global community. Others contend financial and economic shocks, and therefore it should be stopped. What is your position in this debate, and why?